well, the title I chose in the end, we're now at least momentarily going back to uh, machine learning for computational chemistry, for physical chemistry, for material science. And I should start by saying probably thank you to Leslie for introducing many of the concepts and terminology that I'll be using. And I should also say that um, the work that I'll be uh, showing here is largely not done by me, but by diverse people in Michele Ciorotti's group at the MPFL, uh, himself, of course, collaborators. And so I'd like to start by acknowledging them and by thanking the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Um, so the first part of my talk will essentially be about using tools from supervised machine learning to predict materials properties. And just like Leslie, I'll be talking about materials in an atomistic sense. I'll be talking about atomic configurations, uh, atomic structures. And then I'll try and jump to uh, a different topic. Uh, I'll try and show you how one can use tools from unsupervised machine learning to do structure classification with the aim of extracting valuable physical insight from structure data. Now, the feature that these two topics are going to have in common is the structural representation that we use uh, the way we describe our atomic configurations to our machine learning models. And so I'll start by discussing that. Um, and because just like in Leslie's case, we'll be talking a lot about kernel-based me methods, this structure representation is actually a key ingredient. Um, now, the structure representation of choice that we use is in many ways designed uh, to allow machine learning models to reproduce some of the key features that make first principles approaches in uh, physical chemistry such useful and practical tools. And the first of that is that they are generally applicable. The same framework can be applied to a huge variety of systems and to the calculation of a huge variety of different properties. Um, so we'd like to reproduce that. We'd further like to generate a framework that allows us to take into account the basic physical and chemical principles. And by this I mean we'd like a framework that remains invariant when we exchange, at exchange atoms of the same species. We'd like a framework that remains invariant when we translate our atomic configurations and one that transforms in the right way under, um, under rigid rotations of our atomic configuration. Now, if such a framework is ultimately going to be useful, it's further going to have to fill a gap. Uh, by this I mean that it's going to have to fill a gap, for example, between low-cost and low-accuracy model descriptions, such as force fields, and higher accuracy and substantially more expensive first principles approaches such as density functional theory or equivalently between different levels of first principles theories say between DFT and quantum chemistry met methods. Now in the following like I said I'll be talking essentially about kernel based methods that Leslie's already introduced which given an efficient structure representation essentially owe their computational efficiency to the fact that they circumvent expensive calculations of properties by instead interpolating between a set of reference configurations for which the property of interest has already been pre-calculated at the required level of accuracy. This interpolation here with the example of an energy is basically done by a weighted average over a kernel measure of similarity between the structured hand and the different reference configurations. And this kernel we can also consider and write down in the end as an inner product, um, an overlap between the feature vectors that we associate with our structures. Now in first principles approaches, the, the default way of specifying a structure, the, the default representation is simply Cartesian atomic coordinates and if we're talking about a periodic system, some lattice vectors. But this is not a very practical way of describing our atomic configurations in the machine learning context, not least because it's a discontinuous, a point-like description, and so it doesn't lend itself to building smooth machine learning models. So the framework I'll be discussing here instead considers a dressed atom density uh, vector, which in real space you can think of as dressing every atomic position with a Gaussian density distribution and a label that specifies which species we're talking about. This density is then summed over all atoms in the configuration, which has the instant benefit that it becomes invariant under exchange of atoms of the same species. So one of the physical symmetries already fulfilled. Um, now, translation, translational symmetry is essentially gained as a byproduct. It's gained as a byproduct of rendering this structural representation efficient, making it efficient for large atomic configurations. 
which is very simply done by decomposing these configurations, which can be large, which can be infinite if we're talking periodic systems, into local atom-centered environments, which of course means that the atomic positions only ever enter as relative positions, which are translationally invariant. Now, strictly speaking, the features themselves, the feature vectors themselves, do not need to satisfy these physical symmetries as long as the kernel does, because the kernel is what enters the master equation for our, uh, our kernel-based methods. And so in this atom density-based framework, it's actually the kernel that inherits the invariance with respect to exchange of atoms of the same species and with respect to translations from the feature vectors, but is then explicitly rendered uh, invariant under rigid rotations by averaging over all possible uh, rotations of one local atom-centered environment with respect to the other. The key measure of similarity being the overlap of the densities. Now, of course, at this point, what I've really defined is a measure of similarity between environments, between local environments. Um, a global measure of similarity between atomic configurations can very simply be defined by, and in a robust way defined by, just averaging over all possible pairs of environments between the atomic configurations that we, configurations that we have. Uh, there are more sophisticated methods, such as uh, entropy regularized matching, but I'll not discuss those uh, further at this point. Instead, I should mention one thing, which is that in practice, this framework that I've discussed so far, if one expresses the atomic densities in a basis of radial functions and spherical harmonics, it boils down to the definition of the so-called smooth overlap of atomical probabilities framework. And that's indeed the imp implementation that I'll be in practice uh, be using in the, in the applications that I show you. So instead of discussing this further, I'd like to move on to actually showing you a couple of applications that hopefully convince you that this framework does achieve a few things, which is uh, being quite transferable and managing to produce predictions with basically first principles accuracy. And the first example is probably the standard example uh, in machine learning for materials, and that is determination of, uh, of configurational energies. In this case, we're talking about CCSD energies, so quantum chemistry accurate energies, for a set of small isolated gas phase organic molecules from the so-called GEOM9 database. And what I'm showing you here on the left-hand side are learning curves, meaning the prediction area error as a function of the number of reference configurations that we have. Um, there are two colors which encode predictions that are made either on the basis of low accuracy, uh, rather inaccurate, uh, simple model energies and geometries from the so-called PM7 force field, and ones made on the basis of DFT energies and geometries. The key points to note here are, A, we're clearly learning, these configurational energies. B, even when we're basing them on inaccurate geometries from this force field description, at about 20,000 reference structures, we're achieving so-called chemical accuracy of one kilocal per mole, which leaves, in this case, more than 100,000 valuable predictions left to be made for this database. And further, we're managing to predict CCSDD corrections to DFT energies much more accurately still meaning that we can actually promote DFT energies to quantum chemical accuracy in a meaningful, and, uh, in a meaningful way and at essentially negligible computational cost. The second example is kind of designed to show you that this framework is quite transferable because not only are we not discussing isolated small molecules anymore, we are discussing molecular crystals, periodic systems. Moreover, we're not discussing energies anymore. We are now discussing nuclear magnetic resonance shifts. Um, what I'm showing you here are correlation plots between chemical shifts for hydrogen and uh, carbon that are predicted using uh, a machine learning model versus those that are calculated using relatively expensive g poor DFT calculations. And um, for the, if, there any, uh, anyone, if there's anyone familiar with nuclear magnetic resonance shifts, they might see that the accuracy is actually pretty good. It's good enough to essentially match the inherent accuracy of a DFT description of these shifts. Now, these shifts are of interest because they're the key ingredient to solid state nuclear magnetic resonance crystal structure determination protocols, where the basic idea is that one has experimental shifts measured for a sample of which the crystal structure is unknown, and then one generates a bunch of candidate configurations for which one calculates the shifts and then tries to identify matching shifts. 
the crucial thing here being that this machine learning model is, is in the end actually accurate enough to perform crystal structure prediction. So for example, one can determine the crystal structure of cocaine, even though cocaine is not included in the reference data, of course, which is shown here in terms of uh, the read mean square differences between predicted shifts for 30 odd candidate configurations and the experimentally measured ones. And the key observation is that the shifts determined using DFT as well as shift ML end up with the same structure being identified and the correct structure being identified for the crystal structure of cocaine. Now, of course, in material science, we're often not just interested in scalar properties. We are often interested in tensorial properties as well. The key difference being that whilst scalar properties transform invariantly under rigid rotations of our atomic configurations, uh, tensorial properties transform covariantly. And so whilst we can learn scalar properties with a kernel that remains invariant under rigid rotations, we better have a kernel that transforms covariantly if we're going to learn tensorial properties. So basically we need a symmetry adapted, uh, symmetry adapted framework. In order to construct such a symmetry adapted framework, the key observation is that with any tensor we can make a decomposition. We can decompose it into uh, irreducible spherical components. Um, so say the spherical harmonics. Um, which is a convenient basis to use because for these irreducible spherical components, the transformation behavior is well understood and is rather simply described by the Wigner D matrices. Obvious examples being the rank zero tensor, just a scalar that we already know how to work with, uh, the rank one tensor being a vector that we can quite easily see how it would decompose into angular momentum one spherical harmonics, and similarly for higher rank tensors, the mapping becomes a tad more complicated, but is still relatively straightforward. Now, with this decomposition, we have independent angular momentum channels that we can now learn with corresponding kernels that exhibit the right transformation behavior under rigid rotations, which is indeed just ensured by introducing these Wigner D matrices into the rotational averages. So given such a symmetry adapted framework, what can we do with it? Well, for example, we can start learning dipole moments, polarizabilities, and hyperpolarizability tensors. For example, for water oligomers. Uh, in this case, just the monomer, the dimer, and the zimbal cation. And I'm again showing you here learning curves, where, of course, the numerical values of these prediction errors don't mean very much without a lot more context. But uh, let me just put it this way. They're good enough. Uh, that we're very optimistic that we can apply this framework to uh, do things like augment simple model simulations that require, well, simulations that require an explicit treatment of aqueous environments and its dielectric response. The second example of a tensorial property in some sense that one can learn uh, is something that we've already heard about to some degree before as well, electronic densities as the basic uh, quantity in density functional theory. Now here we're talking, or I'm showing electronic densities for butane. Um, in some sense, the most difficult part in our framework is the decomposition of these global quantities into local contributions, which are suitable for learning with a framework that's built around the decomposition of atomic configurations into local atom-centered environments. Um, given our learning strategy, the most natural way to do this is to expand the density in uh, lo local atom-centered contributions which are in turn uh, expanded in a basis of radial functions and spherical harmonics. If one does that, one ends up with a framework that indeed ends up rather being rather accurate and being rather transferable, as can be seen by predicting the electronic densities for different conformers of octane. Um, with the learning er error on the right hand side basically not being visible. So at this point, I hope to have convinced you that this is a framework that's relatively transferable. And so I'll try and make the jump to uh, the use of tools from unsupervised machine learning to structure classification in the attempt to justify the second half of my talk title, trying to extract physics back from structured data. Um, and what I'll be discussing is a framework that tackles a problem that's quite pervasive in 
uh, materials design and drug design ETC, and that is how does one screen a large set of computationally stable hypothetical atomic configurations for the few amongst them uh, that one actually might be able to synthesize in an experiment. Um, there's a conventional method for doing this, which goes by the name of a convex hull construction. And since our framework is in some sense uh, a machine learning extension of that framework, I'll start by describing the basic idea behind the convex hull construction, which is that if we take structure data, so meaning energies and corresponding atomic configurations, geometries, and plot energy as a function of some structural feature, um, then any structure epsilon that's intermediate in that feature with respect to two other structures, theta and lambda, will, at least if we ignore kinetic effects, decompose into a macroscopic phase-separated mixture of theta, of lambda, theta and lambda if that lowers the system energy, as is the case in the example here. The convex hull construction, ex construction exploits that the structures that are stable with respect to such decomposition just constitute the, the, the vertices of a convex hull. And that, that is a very simple to evaluate object. Now, I should also say that, of course, the, the feature determines which feature are to ultimately manipulate to stabilize the different vertices. And so, in some sense, it determines which stabilization mechanism I've taken into account in this convex hull construction. This construction is quite, uh, quite successful, but it's got some key limitations. Um, the first one is that one has to postulate that feature and thereby the stabilization mechanism. And of course, if I choose that feature, for example, to be molar volume, then I can identify structures that I can stabilize by manipulating molar volume, for example, through pressure, but I'm going to miss out on any structure that might require electric fields, magnetic fields, temperature, substitution, etc. And the sec like what I've labeled here is the second and third limitation kind of go a bit hand in hand. And that is that, uh, of course, our structure data generally has uncertainties associated with it that I cannot take into account in a rigorous fashion at this point. And that I also do not have a good means of automatically and robustly eliminating anything that I might have in terms of explicit duplicates or structures that are maybe related by stacking disorder, proton, proton disorder, ETC, so redundant configurations. Now, the first way, so we, have, we try and overcome these limitations, and the first way in which we try and overcome these limitations is by exploiting some very basic tools from unsupervised machine learning. So instead of constructing the convex hull on a postulated intuitive uh, structural feature, we now construct it on one or more uh, features that we have uh, learned in a data-driven way from the data set. So what we actually do is rather simple. We perform a kernel principle component on analysis on a, on, on a kernel measure of similarity between the structures. The result being that we essentially construct the hull on axis of maximum structural diversity and that by constructing on it on just the first few, maybe a handful, we end up exploring the full structural diversity of the data set. How much time do I have left? Roughly? Five minutes? Okay. In that case, uh, the second way is, in some sense, to, to, the, to the material science community, typically a lot more intuitive, and that is that we try and rigorously, or more rigor rigorously, account for the uncertainties and energies and structural features that we have, which of course means that our convex hull is not actually, de is not actually deterministic, it's not actually uniquely defined. Uh, we should really be thinking about a convex hull distribution. Uh, and given that, what we really want to be doing is sampling that distribution. So what do we practically do? Well, we take our structure data and we randomize the energies and, and geometries according to their uh, associated uncertainties. Construct a convex hull, randomize, construct a convex hull, and we keep doing that until we arrive at a stable convex hull distribution, at which point the fraction of the convex hulls that a given structure has uh, constituted vertex on gives us essentially a measure of its likelihood or its, its chance of being stabilizable. This is beneficial in, in, in two ways in particular. One is that it renders this identification of stable structures rather insensitive with respect to the underlying energetics. The other is that it gives us a means of eliminating redundant structures quite simply because you can imagine that if you've got multiple representatives of the same stable phase, 
then they compete for stability, they compete for a spot on the hull, they end up with low individual uh, probabilities for being stabilizable, and so we can just start throwing out the lowest probability candidates and resampling, at which point we start accumulating uh, ultimately the entire probability uh, on one single representative for, for a given uh, stable phase. Now, as an example of the kind of physical insight that one can extract from an actual database, structured database with this construction, I'd like to show you this, uh, this example here, which is that of a bit over 50,000 oxygen-hydrogen binary structures at 20 gigapascals constructed in a random structure search. A random structure search essentially gives you a pretty diverse data set. Uh, it's, it's, it's very simple, and if anybody's interested, I can, and I can vaguely describe it afterwards. Um, the way I'm uh, representing this data here is on a map that's spanned by the first two principal components. Uh, their numerical values, of course, not being particularly meaningful, so they're not shown. And then colored according to this uh, probability of being stabilizable. Now, if one does this elimination of redundant structures, the, the, what we call the generalized convex hull construction identifies about 100 uh, stabilizable phases, amongst them the expected high-pressure hydrogen, high-pressure ice, hydrogen peroxide structures, and then it identifies a couple of oxygen structures which are interesting uh, and which I'll spend the last couple of minutes discussing a bit further. They're interesting because amongst them we don't just have the experimentally known about ones. The experimentally known structures have the oxygen molecules, if you wish, aligned in a rectangular parallel fashion in this so-called H pattern. But the convex hull further suggests structures in which the molecules exhibit a tilt pattern with respect to that. These are energetically really rather unfavorable and would have escaped any conventional uh, kind of uh, stability analysis. What renders them stable in this generalized convex hull construction is indeed the silt. And if one goes a bit further, one can show a posteriori using spin polarized density functional theory calculations that this tilt is essentially related to the stabilization that one can achieve by imposing strong external magnetic fields. And so this map is now colored roughly uh, speaking according to this stabilization, or spanned still by the same principal components, and, and then colored according to the stabilization that can be achieved by external magnetic fields. So what the generalized convex hull, what the machine learning aspect, or the unsupervised machine learning aspect of this convex hull construction has achieved here is that it has identified for us a quite subtle stabilization mechanism, stabilization by an external magnetic field, which we didn't know about beforehand and that would, we would have missed out on uh, with any conventional construction. And with this, I hope to have uh, kind of justified both halves of my talk title, and I'll just leave you with a summary slide. And thank you for your attention.